Okay, so we left Hiroshima heading for Osaka on the Shinkansen bullet train. Let's pull up that map again. So this train is going from Hiroshima up to Osaka, and it does this in an hour and 26 minutes. Just to get a sense of scale, I pulled up a map of southern Ontario, scaled to the same scale. This blew my mind. I knew that Japan was small and Canada was big, but what's surprising to me is Japan's density. I've driven from Kitchener to Kingston several times, and I know that trip, and I know how empty it feels. You drive for a bit, and then hit Toronto, and then you get through it, and then there's basically nothing for a few hours, and then you're there. Taking the train from Hiroshima to Osaka instead feels like crossing a country. There's different mountains. You whip past town after town and farm communities. It feels like there's a lot of country that we're skipping over, whereas the trip to Kingston feels like there's a lot of nothing there that we'd love to skip. Also, covering this distance in an hour and 20 minutes would be nice. We weren't going to be in Osaka very long, so we checked into our hostel-like thing. It gave us a private room, and what a room it was! Honestly, it was cheap and close to the things we wanted to go to. It wasn't actually that bad. The thing Osaka is most famous for is the Dotonbori Food District. It's basically just a nightlife district with lots of restaurants and stuff. The kind of main area has these glitzy, flashy sign things that are quite famous. That guy. This guy. The district is centered along this riverfront, and so the area that I was showing you a second ago was just like one block off from the river. We'd seen these cheesy coins in a few places by now, and we wanted to give it a shot here. Turns out it was sweeter than we expected it to be. Well, yeah, it's like a waffle. No, I mean, like, the cheese is also sweet. Mmm. Yeah, we weren't much a fan of them. This shot here is kind of the shot of Osaka. That billboard there is the Glico Man, uh, but it's normally not shot during the rain and during the daylight. I left this in just in case you forgot that Japan is not always quiet. So what do you do in a nightlife district when it's raining and it's not nighttime? You go to the dollar store and you buy some $10 wireless earbuds and a camping tool, obviously. So now we're heading back through that Glico area now that it's dark. It's so interesting seeing things because you look up Osaka and you're going to see a, a picture of the Glico man. But it's interesting seeing what's around it. You know, you don't hear the four songs that are all competing and the dude beatboxing over there and like get a sense of what the general area is. It's just a photo. Often the same photo. It's interesting. For dinner, we went down one of these side streets and found an udon noodle place. We couldn't film there, though, because it was so shoulder to shoulder with everyone. There, it wasn't a very big place. Uh, people would just come in, they would eat, and then they would leave in like five minutes and they didn't say anything. It was actually a little intimidating, you know, because you didn't want to screw it up. Uh, it was neat, but a little scary. <laughs> Yeah. Now we're back to that first bridge, that's Glico off in the distance there actually, uh, to get some takoyaki before going back to our accommodations for the night. Alright, so this is a bit of a saga. So like I've said before, there's vending machines all over this country. Um, and a while back, we saw one that had a product called CC Lemon Peach. CC Lemon is the brand, peach is the flavor. Um, but the machine was broken, we wanted to try it, but uh, you know, it was out of stock of everything. It may have even been abandoned. Um, so since then, we've been keeping our eye out for CC Lemon Peach. And as far as we could tell, there were only two kinds of vending machines in this country. The kinds that had CC Lemon Peach and were busted and the kinds that did not have CC Lemon Peach but worked. But here in Osaka, we found one that both worked and had CC Lemon Peach, so we were very excited. I've been searching for forever! It's so bad! So that was our first night in Osaka. But we realized we had a problem. You see, we came to a nightlife town and we stayed in a hostel in a nightlife district, but we're not nightlife people. Which would prove to be something of a problem later. Also, we saw our first Japanese rat in Osaka. It was right next to the CC Lemon Peach vending machine. So anyways, that was our first night. 
So you wake up, but it's early morning in a nightlife district, so there's nothing to do. So you're like, well, what the hell else is in Osaka? And there's a castle, so we decided to head there. Boy, do they love a moat in this country. Started off with a bit of breakfast. I've had our onigiri pressed rice ball, and I also had one of those and a prepackaged pancake. Sorry, what's that? Have I not told you about the prepackaged pancake? I'll go to the pages in a sec. I got important business to do. So these are the best thing. It's a pancake on the bottom, and then a ring wall of margarine that they fill with syrup, and then they put another pancake on top, and then they wrap the whole thing up and sell them prepackaged in convenience stores. Once I discovered these, I ate a lot of them. Oh yeah, this was cool too. So this is an old public radio. The idea is that radio had already been invented, but people didn't own them in their homes yet. So they set up these radio stations so you could go out and listen to them in public in a group. But they didn't want them to be ugly, so they wrapped them in this kind of faux old lantern shell so that they would kind of match the aesthetic of the area. It's the kind of thing that makes sense that should exist, but I never really thought about them before. There was a dude here in the garden who was practicing the shamisen, which is this thing, the instrument. Um, but I didn't really want to bother him by recording him or asking or anything, so instead I recorded the moat, but you can hear him in the background. Just listen. Jeez, was that all I recorded? Anyway, it was cool. So now we're on the grounds, and there's a the castle tower up there in the distance. Where's that? Before we got there, there was this castle garden that we went to. Uh, azaleas were all the rage this time of year. They were the hot new thing. We also found a cute little lizard. Go, you little bastard, go! Oh, lizard. So we get to the bottom of the tower, and there's this big long line to get up there, and it costs money, and the line is partly in the sun, and we're like, eh. Fuck that, we were just in a tower like a day and a half ago in Hiroshima. We can see the city just fine from down here, thanks. I did want to film this plaque though because it was so indicative of the situation with the castles here in Japan. So basically this says, oh yeah, the tower was first built in 1585 and then it was burned down during the Summer War in 1615, which means it lasted about 30 years. And then the second tower was built in 1626, so 10 years later. But then that one burned down from a lightning strike in 1665, so that one only lasted about 40 years. And then the tower was rebuilt a third time from concrete in 1933 with donations from the local area modeled after a painting. So like, okay, like this actual building isn't even 100 years old yet. It's just based on a painting of a building that stood for 40 years, like 400 years ago. Eh? All right, so now what? Well, Steph found that there was a museum of like traditional arts and uh, crafts, but it was way the heck up here. Uh, so we had to take like an hour long train and then an hour long walk to get out to the grounds of the Expo 70. Well, it wasn't crowded. Man, do expos love monorails. So it seems like it's a pretty nice park. What the hell is that thing? Anyway, it seems nice, but it was eerily empty. Maybe because it was so far from everything. I will say, out front of the museum, they had one of the most beautiful wisteria displays we saw the whole time we were there. They had so many varieties of wisteria, all with little signs telling you which was which, and then spread out on this massive frame. I wasn't embarrassed to film this part, because even the Japanese people were stopping to take pictures of these.
Way back at the back there is the museum. Uh, they had a, an exhibit on Shibori indigo dyeing. They had a bunch of old kimonos and stuff, but we were not allowed to film there. But there was one other thing on these grounds that had piqued my interest. This is called the Tower of the Sun. It's 70 meters or 230 feet tall. During the expo, it was part of the main pavilion and the second story actually was held in its hands. And then that gold face actually punched up through the roof and stared out across the grounds. I liked it very much. Speaking of tall things, the last thing we did on these fairgrounds was ride a really big Ferris wheel. Okay, now we're halfway up. This might be as big as the one that I... It isn't. Maybe bigger. Maybe. Nope. This Ferris wheel is the Red Horse Osaka wheel, which is the tallest in Japan at 123 meters tall. On the other hand, the London Eye is 135 meters tall, so slightly taller. It's hard to tell because the London Eye was kind of like surrounded by tall buildings. And this is kind of surrounded by parking lots. Yeah. Excellent point past me. Here's the view from the top of this thing. You can see how it's pretty empty. Like you can see all the way to the mountains off in the distance there. And all of the buildings are pretty far away and pretty low. And so it feels pretty high up. And I mean, look, 123 meters is pretty high up. But for comparison, here are some photos from the top of the London Eye. So they're similar in height, but I think this view from Osaka feels much taller. Also, we were curious while we were up there, uh, but it turns out that this wheel on the map is almost exactly east-west. So the place that we were staying, Dotonbori and Osaka Castle and everything, is almost exactly due south. So it's just there, that hump in the distance, I think. From there, we took the monorail back to civilization and we went to a district called Shinsekai, which is kind of the Dotonbori before Dotonbori was Dotonbori. But we hated it? It was just a bunch of tourist trappy garbage. I mean, there was more hidden fees at this fishing-based restaurant than any of the other restaurants we went to. And then one block in any direction was just kind of like sketchy, depressed area. So then we went from this depressing area back to our nightlife hostel, and we kind of went to bed that night thinking, I think I hate Osaka. So the next morning, instead of sticking around Osaka, we took a day trip that we were going to take during the Kyoto part of our trip, and we went to a different city called Wakayama. We went to visit Tama. Tama was a cat who in 2007 was made the station master of the ailing Kishi station and immediately became something of a tourist attraction after that. Now, is this just an obvious gimmick to attract tourists? Absolutely. But it's the kind we love. It's a cat who's a station master of a train station. Given the success of Tama, they started putting more interesting trains on the line uh, to try and keep the excitement going. This particular train is called Umeboshi, which is a pickled plum that's very popular in Japan. Sadly, Tama died in 2015, and after being enshrined at the station, was given the title of Honorary Eternal Station Master. So we're actually on our way to visit her protege and successor, Ni Tama. Literally, Tama 2. It's 
not shocking that Kishi would be struggling. Basically, every town in Japan has its population going down. The whole country's population isn't growing very much, and most of the population growth that's occurring is occurring in the big cities like Tokyo. So a system would have low ridership simply because there aren't a lot of people in this area anymore. So anything they could do to try to attract some city folk in from the city is to their benefit. Like maybe having a cat as a station master. Alright, so we've arrived in Kishi and we're ready to meet Nitama. Yep, she's a cat in a box and she's sweet as heck. She's not wearing her station master hat today, but she's got it nearby up on the top left there. Oh, she's licking her foot. With the success of the whole Tama thing, they remodeled the station to have a more cat-like appearance. Uh, there's also a gift shop in there and a cafe, uh, which sells a bunch of Tama merch, uh, which I didn't film, but I'll show some photos of later. But other than that, there's not really much here. There's We got some ice cream over there, and uh, yep, that's about it. When we went back inside, she was having a nap. By the way, those are photos of original Tama on the wall there, and the gift shop through the back so the station master can have the crusts wiped out of her eyes. Okay, quick photo slideshow. These are the prayer tablets at the shrine outside the station. This is the entrance into the station coming off of the tracks. There's actually four cats now. From left to right, that's Tama, Ni Tama, who we visited today, San Tama, and Yon Tama. San Tama actually works on a different train line, and Yon Tama covers Ni Tama's off days. And this is the schedule that tells you which day which cat is where. That's the gift shop through the window, the Tama Station Master hat, merch with cafe in the back, portrait of Tama overseeing Ni Tama, felt Tama, felt Ni Tama, real Ni Tama sleeping, merch, floor tiles in the cafe, merch, close up merch, Tama's official regalia. Tama in the regalia. Merch. Merch. Ice cream sandwich from the cafe. Drink from the cafe. And that's the end of the Tama station. The train on the way back was called Chuggington, uh, which was way less cool than the Umeboshi on the way in. I think it's a kid's TV show, but it was basically just a normal train with a Chuggington themed fabric and a Chuggington wrap but I guess we'd already met Tama, so. We went back to Wakayama satisfied. Wakayama is a nice but pretty typical Japanese town. Uh, we originally came here obviously because of its train connection to the rail line that Tama lives on, but while we were here, they also have a castle. Wakayama's castle was our favorite of the ones I visited, I think. Um, a lot of the other ones are a little bit more like gift shops and a museum, uh, and this one is a little bit like that, but it, it still felt very castle-y. The castle grounds and this little bridge up over the moat here. Uh, it still felt like, a, it, like it was a castle. It also had this crazy tree coming up over the walls here, which I assume is older than our country. I don't even think Japan has tigers. They had these cool shallow steps slash pseudo ramp here that had these channels cut in it so that when the water, uh, when it rained, the water would run across the ramp and down rather than running down the face of it, making the whole thing into a sluice. Do people say sluice? Also, while we were there, they were setting up a political rally. You could hear them the whole time. A lot of the stones that they built this uh, ground out of here had this weird bluish tint to them. That's not a trick of the camera. They looked kind of bluish in person. I don't know what those are. It's clearly different than the stones that they built like that wall there out of. I don't know. It looked kind of neat though. 
And then there's the main castle tower, or Tenshu. They had some of the largest carp streamers we saw while we were in Japan. Once we got in there, it was pretty similar to all the rest of them. It was a museum, basically, with some old samurai artifacts and stuff. But unlike some of them, we were actually allowed to film some of the things in this one. So I filmed what I could. This is a wooden model of the building that we're in, what it would have been like to have constructed this thing. This is the people carrier that the lord of this castle would have been carried around in. Tiger. 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 Birdie. Birdie, birdie, birdie. This is some real armor I was able to film. It was cool seeing it up close and seeing how all the different materials that kind of went into it, you know? There was like some chain and some cord and some leather and some metal plates and not to mention just like padded cloth and it was all stitched together and layered uh, to bring the whole garment together. It was cool. These are some carp decorations that would adorn, you know, the edges of the walls and the, the eaves and things like that so the water would shoot out of their mouth. Fancy. As silly as it is, I even just like looking out the tower windows at the roof, because like, that's a pretty Japanese roof, am I right? I mean, well, okay, you can't really see it right now, but like, look at it. That's a cool looking roof. It's funny, kind of like I was saying before, I mean, we originally came to Wakayama just to transfer through to the other city of Kishi to visit Tama. Um, and the little bit of the town that we walked through to get from the train station to the castle was pretty small, but like, look at this place. It is a massive town. Oh, it's Steph. Oh, hello, Steph. We left the castle through this old gate, which survived some of the fires that took out some of the other parts of the castle at various points in its history. So this part was actually older than all the rest of them. Uh, and so you can see, you know, some of the more original woodworking and stuff like this. This is the gate that would have stood here when this castle was functioning as a castle that protected a lord, uh, which is pretty cool. Somehow Wakayama is also known for oranges, so the last thing we did was have some orange soft serve ice cream, which was weird because it tasted like oranges and not ice cream, and we waited for our train. So we had a nice day trip to Wakayama, we met a cat who runs a train station, we walked around a castle and we ate some ice cream. But then it was back to Osaka, and we still had one full day left in Osaka. The next morning Steph had a particular fabric store that she wanted to hit, so we just set off and we saw some things along the way. Yasuka Shrine is relatively famous for having a stage where the top looks like a lion head. Touristy, but neat. The rest of the shrine is really pretty too. I mean, we're surrounded on all sides here by tall buildings, but it still somehow feels very peaceful. The Museum of the Mint was also along our route here, like the money kind of a mint. They had some of the old minting machines out front here. Uh, we went in, but we weren't allowed to film in there. It was cool reading about how they used to make money. They also had some tiny replicas inside, showing how the machines would stamp out the metal. God, I love tiny replicas. Another thing they made were the medals for the 2020 uh, Olympics, uh, the materials of which were entirely gathered from melted down recycled electronics. Neat! It's like every time we've been to a temple, they've been doing something. This is one of the bigger Buddhist temples in Osaka. Ah. And in fact, it has a sister temple in Kyoto, which we did not visit. This lady in the blue here tracked us down later and talked to us for longer than was necessary. She told us all about the history and the legend of the temple and all about Buddhist wedding ceremonies, which was lovely. She was sweet, but like we were just passing through. Also, Steph loves when I move the camera in like this and never got tired of it. There was this nice park here where the line for the women's bathroom looked straight through the open door of the men's bathroom, right across the urinals. That was fun. And they had this nice flea market right outside the central library near the park. And finally, we made it to the store that we were actually heading towards. This is the Nanny Iro store. Nanny Iro is a high-end fabric brand that Steph really likes, and this is their home location in Osaka. We were actually in there for quite a while. The staff was lovely and very patient, uh, but now we're walking home. 
On the way back, we came across this really nice park. Those are rose trellises up over the path there. Um, and then down along the green here, there's just all sorts of people here with their family. Uh, there's an artificial stream that runs through the middle of the park. And then people down there are just all camped out under like little tents to protect them from the sun. And it was like, oh, this is where Osaka actually lives. The people who live in Osaka come here. That makes sense. The park also had these creepy statues that had way too much detail in their fabric. It made them too real. It doesn't sound like It actually felt weird inspecting them up this close, like I was invading their personal space. That's how effective these statues were. So having found real Osaka, we were content to return to our nightlife district to get a signature dish on our last night. This is Osaka-style okonomiyaki, which is different from Hiroshima-style okonomiyaki, which we had last time. Uh, the difference is that this one doesn't have noodles in it, so it's thinner. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Good night, Osaka. Maybe you're not so bad after all. So that was our conflicted trip to Osaka. It was something of a low point in the trip for us, which is actually pretty lucky because it wasn't that bad. And it especially started to get better once we started moving out of the more touristy parts. And from Osaka, our next destination was Kyoto.